Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. And okay. if you can go full screen mode to make sure that it is in the right screen. Yes, it's, it's great. Um, yeah, we have about three minutes uh, before we start the last talk. <clears throat> All right, I guess uh, we can get it started. It's exactly 2 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, it's my uh, great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, our last speaker of the day, Professor George Kanyandakis from Brown University. Uh, so as an introduction, uh, George received his PhD from MIT in 1987. He then uh, joined Princeton University as an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, and also as an associate faculty in the Program of Applied and Computational Mathematics. Um, he was also a visiting professor at Caltech in 1993 in the aeronautics department, and then he uh, joined Brown University as an associate professor of applied mathematics in the center of fluid mechanics in 1994. He has been a full professor since 1996 at Brown University, and he is also a visiting professor and senior lecturer in the ocean and mechanical engineering uh, at MIT. Professor Karnandakis uh, is a fellow in multiple societies, including AAAS, SIAM, APS, ASME, AIAA. Um, he has received a, a lot of award, including uh, the SIAM ACM Prize on Computational Science and Engineering in 2021, very recently. The Alexander von Hummelt Award in 2017, the SIAM Rolf Kleinman Award, the Tinsley Oden Medal and the CFD Award in 2007 by the US Association in Computational Math Mechanics. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Kanye Dukis. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mahir. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, before I go to my own talk, I would like to say that uh, something about Rose's talk on UQ. Um, uh, UQ for neural networks is uh, very, very important. I've been working on UQ for 25 years, but uh, for neural networks is particularly important. We just released a paper, 104 pages, on 12 different ways to do UQ in neural networks, paying attention in particular not just to one type of uncertainty, namely the um, epistemic uh, uncertainty, but also including the aleatoric uncertainty, and that uh, could complicate things. So. Um, uh, this will be available soon 
uh, with a library. The library is called uh, UQ for Scientific Machine Learning. So we will have everything uh, uh, open uh, for everyone to, to try it. Um, going back to my talk here, I would like to start with this uh, offering some coffee to every one of you. And this is, um, I like this. I work with lots of different uh, people and different experiments, but uh, I, I'm, I was very happy to convince a company to do an experiment for me, uh, for this problem of interest of mine for many, many years since I started drinking coffee. So this is an espresso cup uh, and we're looking at the uh, Slerum photography over 3D actually, that's why you see all these multiple cameras here on the right. And just from a gradient of density, can you guess what is the maximum velocity, the pressure and so on over the coffee, the espresso cup? Now, if you can do that, of course, you can solve a lot of inverse problems for which we don't know, you don't know boundary conditions, you don't know exactly the models and so on. So there's models mis misspecification issues, there are lots of issues, but ultimately this is an ill-posed problem and how do you solve it? I'll get back to it uh, uh, a, a little later on, but in the broader scheme of things, what we introduce uh, uh, with um, Maja Raisi and Paris Perdicaris and others uh, years ago, it was this concept of physics informed learning, how you can, um, we're not replacing uh, standard solvers, we're not replacing good finite elements and uh, we like spectral methods and so on, but, but we're really looking at this middle paradigm where we have some noisy guppy data, not necessarily where you, you want them to be, not, not at the boundaries, for example, but somewhere where, uh, and, then, and then can you, uh, and you don't know the physics or you may know the physics, but you cannot resolve it. And so, so what can you do to learn synergistically from data and physics? Uh, this is the old data simulation uh, problem, of course, but present it in a new, uh, in a new uh, uh, simpler, I, I, I would say, um, recasting. And then we're also looking at systems for which we may know no physics at all. Uh, it could be a very complex systems, systems that you don't want to, to uh, um, uh, write down all the equations and so on, too expensive or too difficult. And then, but you have some observations Social systems could be like that, uh, we don't know. Uh, and then we're trying to identify that system using operator regression. So we go from neural PDEs to neural operators, and I'll talk about that in terms of pins and deep net. So as I said, physics informed learning is not, is not new for us. We propose it to um, the Department of Energy and just like any good idea, um, it looks like a good idea now, it didn't look that good idea when we first proposed it. Of, and and uh, I also want to say for the record that this idea was rejected four times uh, by NSF. And now I'm happy now to see that young people write successful proposals using P the PINS method. I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, uh, it was discovered by um, uh, NVIDIA and today, uh, some time ago, uh, and, and, and NVIDIA now is, uh, uh, is very, they have their own division uh, on uh, and their own uh, software that started with Maja Raisi, one of the co-authors of the original paper, um, was hired by uh, NVIDIA. Now they have uh, a core that they call Modulus, and they go out in uh, different domains from biomedicine to engineering, um, uh, digital twins, and so on. So, um, as I said, this, this paper, um, which was also rejected, I, li I like this, I'm old uh, guy now, so I can say all these papers have been rejected because I want to encourage the young people, okay? Just go out and, and do your own thing. Don't, don't listen to this. Uh, I, I handle lots of journals and I know how the reviewers now, how the reviewers uh, uh, think and so on, but uh, just do your own thing and, uh, and go for it. So anyway, what is a PIN? A PIN is um, this composite neural network. Uh, it's a standard neural network here on the right. Uh, and then we have this, uh, sorry, on the left, and here's uh, the one on the right that uh, enforces, imposes these differential constraints. So in addition to the mismatch in, um, in data for this, uh, here we pretend we, we have a mechanics field, elasticity. Uh, so we have U1 and U2, uh, the two states for displacements, and we want to uh, learn this uh, uh, field using uh, 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 this, this PD, so that will give me an extra uh, constraint here, as you can see, and it's a weighted sum of those will give me a loss function. 
Um, so the implementation is very easy. That's why I think it's, it's not a, a, you know, the most uh, original idea ever. I wouldn't say that, but, but the implementation is very simple because we use uh, automatic differentiation to deal with this uh, operators. And here's an example in a code in Python. Uh, you can write in, in sorry, in, in TensorFlow, you can write in PyTorch now, but uh, it shows that in the domain X and T, and we never discretize T or X, these are continuous variables. So you avoid some of the typical problems of artificial diffusion, dispersion, and so on. Uh, you have some data, that could be the boundary data. As, as you can see, there's a gap here uh, in the boundary conditions. You cannot solve this problem, for example, using uh, any, any standard solver because you don't have data of the boundary here. So that's right there is a ill-posed problem. But you can see here, by we can have one line to define the data network, one line to define these operators, and take the gradients uh, for, the, for this uh, governing law, and then we sum them up, and basically 10 minutes later, you get the solution. Uh, and even a high, high school student can implement that. In fact, we have now several high, high school students who are working on PINs. I'll show you some results later by high school students. So, of course, that's the original idea. Uh, there are probably hundreds, if not a thousand of papers already that explain how you can um, make, do this better. Uh, we're also not sitting idle. Um, so, so one of the um, techniques we in introduce is uh, space-time domain decomposition. So especially time decomposition and, and parallelism in time are extremely difficult, but here it's very, very natural. You can see, for example, for the same problem, the Berger's equation that I showed you before, you can decompose the space and time arbitrarily. You don't have to have a convex domain, could be this dolphin. And then inside the dolphin, you assign one neural network. Uh, outside the dolphin, you assign a different neural networks. You can tune those the, the, the neural networks uh, independently. Uh, the question is how do you stitch those solutions from the two different neural networks? But again, that's very simple because in the context of residual minimization that we're doing now, residuals are continuous. Therefore, you just impose continuity of uh, residuals at the minimum. If you want, you can impose continuity also of the solution and so on. But you can see here, pretty good looking solutions. And this idea now has a theoretical uh, justification. In this theory, in this paper here on the bottom, uh, we use uh, baron spaces. In fact, generalized baron spaces. The baron spaces were defined for two layers. You have to recursively, you can define baron spaces and you can obtain norms, the baron norms. And those baron norms in the subdomains will tell you, is it better to do pins or X pins? Now you say, why would you do pins? Because you have more data. If you do X pins, you have less data and so on. So, so, but of course we have simpler solutions. So it's a trade-off between pins and X pins. And this gives you a priori and a posteriori estimates to decide what to do. There's some other ideas. Um, uh, I like this idea, which I have adopted in all our codes now, is this, this um, weighted sum of the different losses. So you can have constraints, you can have uh, boundary conditions, you can have in the, in the loss function. Now, uh, you can, there are other ways of picking the weights manually or some other ways, but, but I like this one where you make these functions of space time, and then basically you can find them uh, using uh, as, as just another hyperparameters, okay? Uh, so I, I call this idea clever because it comes from clever Ulysses from, from uh, as a professor at Texas A&M. And uh, what I like particularly here is that these weights follow the physics. For example, in this bad Boussinesse equation, that's called bad Boussinesse uh, equations because of, of the structure of this fourth derivative, you can see here, the solution looks pretty tricky and the weights actually follow that. So by having that, um, the, the weights are changing space time, you can actually do refinements and, and so on. Uh, you can look at multi-scale and stiff problems. Other ideas to enhance this, and this is idea that goes beyond pins. It goes to all neural networks, for example, um, for dynamical systems or not. And that is the idea of introducing adaptive activation functions. More recently, we introduced this uh, neural networks, which we call deep chronicler neural networks, because you can see they are structured down here. Uh, uh, these, are, these are basically activation functions. And you can see I, ha I have multiple activation functions, in fact, um, uh, they are different for each layer. And these are adaptive activation functions 
in a sense that you can learn them from scratch or you can assume their form. For example, you can, they can assume that they're hyperbolic tangents. And sometimes you can also superimpose, I call them rowdy, uh, like noisy, because people have found that if you add noise, of course, in, uh, uh, you avoid the explosive gradients uh, vanishing um, gradients and so on. So, so in, in this case, um, for example, you can see how these adaptive activation functions will move from one layer to the other to, ad to adapt to specific, um, in this particular case, uh, uh, high frequency solutions. Uh, so these are enhancements. We have theory, again, that goes with this, that shows that if you do have these adaptive activation functions, in fact, um, you can uh, prove that theoretically that you never get into a bad minimum. You may not always find the, the global minimum, but you, you guarantee that you will not get into all, uh, one of these plateaus that, uh, that uh, destroys convergence uh, in the atom and so on. Let me go back to, as I said, there are high, stu high school students who are really interested in this. And this Jeremy uh, Yu uh, was uh, intern at MIT in the summer and he undertook this project. So he, uh, what he did is he added, uh, I had this idea some time ago, but none of my students implemented it fully. So, so it was to add actually uh, into, in the residual, you can also add this term, which is the gradient. And the reason you do that is because, because sometimes like in collocation methods, spectral collocation methods, the residual will, will be zero at the, at the points, but then it oscillates very, very highly in between, but penalizing the gradient will alleviate that. Of course, it's expensive, but there are, the, so, so one could find, um, um, with adaptive, with a, a, a automatic differentiation, this could be too expensive, but actually there are ways to, uh, to overcome this. But at this point, if we look at the accuracy for this inverse problem, this uh, uh, diffusion reaction equation, where you can see that, uh, uh, that this, uh, what he calls G-pin, gradient enhanced uh, pin, does much better, uh, not just for the velocity or the residual, but also, of course, now you are looking at at derivatives, so these are much more accurate. Eventually, if you have lots of training points, you can see pins and G-pins are, are catching up, but, uh, but uh, there is a, an effect. Of, unfortunately, uh, the cost of this is twice as much, so, so it's pre pretty much uh, break even with, uh, with uh, pins if you use standard automatic differentiation because of the higher derivatives. Um, I want to take a, a few minutes to talk about uh, this um, uh, hidden fluid mechanics, which uh, is a paper we published in Science a couple of years ago. And the idea was, again, to solve the seal pose problem, like the coffee problem that I, I, I talked about earlier. And here, for, for example, you can see we're looking at a flow around a seal in the downstream, and I only observe this arbitrary cutout with uh, some dive visualization. Uh, just no boundary conditions, no geometry, no Reynolds numbers, no, no other parameters. Can you infer the velocity field and the pressure field there and the answer is yes. If you bring in the equations, now the die will be modeled by this um, a passive scalar equation. You don't need to know even the Peclet number, and then you include the momentum equation and the divergence and free and so on. And just by matching the die that you have with the uh, prediction by the neural network, you set up an iteration loop and you can obtain the velocity and the pressure at no cost. If you want to get the force on the body, you have to have the die going around and then you can get within 5% good forces. This can be applied to more important problems. For example, the rupture of an aneurysm. Uh, this is a real aneurysm with a real uh, artery. Uh, and uh, what the doctor sees is something here on the right, some contrasting agent. And at some point when they see, they see something, they have to, which I don't know exactly what they see, uh, they have to uh, operate. Uh, usually they go by the size of the annuals, which is very, very crude, but they, sometimes they do this. So, so this is data that exists, okay? So the question is, can you use this data to find the forces on the aneurysmal sac, and therefore you can infer when this will rupture or not? Very important. Uh, of course, you have to deal with the tissue or mechanics also. But here we show again, you can model this contrasting agent with this simple equation here for imaging. And then you have the, the model, non-Newtonian model here, uh, and we only need to zoom in here in the aneurysmal sac. You don't need to do like we do in CFD with big domains, inflows, outflows, because we can deal with um, problems without inflow boundaries. So um, you can um, very quickly uh, realize that indeed you can find the three-dimensional fields, you can find the force, you can find the pressure, uh, and you can get pretty good solutions. You always 
need to do CFD to check your solutions because you don't have answers in this real problem. So you need to do a, on the side something like that to show that what you learn and what uh, we use with uh, traditional solvers uh, uh, is consistent. Going back to, to the coffee example, we published a paper recently in the general fluid mechanics about uh, this coffee espresso, uh, the espresso coffee here. And you can see, this is what we get in one plane. We have several planes for 3D and then we try to match it. And in the process, we find the pressure field. And we also find the velocity field. It turns out that people didn't believe us. So I didn't believe our own results, to tell you the truth talking about uncertainty in neural networks. So they, so they went back and they did an independent experiment with PIV to verify that was, uh, was right. And the reason La Vision was uh, interested in what we're doing is because early in the pandemic, we uh, took one of their videos from YouTube. This is Thomas Berg, my collaborator. And we said, okay, maybe we can infer from this YouTube video, a velocity field and the pressure around the mouth and the nose of Thomas with and without his mask and indeed, Using the same technique I just showed you, we were able to quantify uh, the velocity, the pressure here, uh, the pressure field is here, uh, and also the velocity field. Uh, uh, so, so we have since then we have developed this method in something called AIV, and we have a patent, artificial intelligence velocimetry that can apply to um, all sorts of situations. And uh, TSI and LaVision, other big companies, Seika in Japan, are interested in this. Um, so any, anyway, uh, since this is about dynamical systems, I want to show you an ultimate dynamical system. This is um, 256 drones trying to cross from, in, they're in the room. They're trying to go from one side of the room to the other in the minimum uh, time, right? And they, of course, they have to avoid collisions and, and so on. And um, in order to solve this, we uh, use a hamilton jacobi equation and we use pins right, for the residual of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. In addition, we use something else. It's a symplectic integrator that we developed uh, in the context of neural networks, something we call simp, uh, simp nets, um, that basically maps the trajectory, these arbitrary trajectories uh, to a something simpler, in fact, straight lines. That's what the symplectic integrator would do. And then we do a minimization. And it turns out it's in about one hour on, on the A1000, uh, the Ampere 1000, well, in one hour, we can solve this problem, which is, of course, in 512 dimensions, 256 drones times two. So this, I think, is one of the most difficult problems. Um, and I think we have the record on the number of drones. So they told us, the Navy told us to do 22 drones. This is 256 drones. Another, another um, I have a couple of slides also on something else, uh, how useful it is to include any, 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 any uh, knowledge that you have in the system in discovering a system. Uh, for example, here I summarize how you could find new dynamical systems from data and could be just a pure data-driven approach. Uh, you may have seen that from different types of regression. Of course, they always recover the same equations that, they start, they, that we know, so there's no new, no new surprises here. But one of the uh, questions is, is, is uh, can you extrapolate in time after you find these equations because it's become very unstable. So here, and how will this generalize? So, so we thought that uh, you really need to put as much physics as you, as you could. And I mean physical principles, not necessarily the equations in here. So I want to show you one particular formulation uh, which we introduced and this, from thermodynamics. This is a sort of a, um, the generic formalism uh, was produced, was developed by Ottinger at ETH and basically mathematizes the entropy condition and, and the energy. Z here, Z would be the trajectories. So you're looking at this expression and, the, and you see now um, in order to have energy conservation automatically and entropy being increasing, you have to have these constraints. E will be the energy, S will be the entropy, but you have to satisfy these orthogonality constraints um, automatically, not, not as soft constraints, it turns out. So anyway, there's a, a good reason to, so, so, the, so the question is, how do you put that structure? So now what I showed you before is we just put the PDs. Now we will actually design a neural network architecture that automatically will satisfy these constraints. So it's inspired by this. So, so we're going to have uh, neural networks for uh, all these matrices. E and S is the energy and the, uh, and the entropy. We have four neural networks and those four neural networks are connected together 
so that they form this orthogonal module. So that's sort of the high level uh, architecture. Now, what we do is, although there are four neural networks, we do a single minimization over all the parameters of all these four neural networks. And so we, we uh, make sure that uh, we, sa we satisfy these constraints, as I said, uh, automatically under any con conditions, not that self constraints or. So, uh, so doing that, we try different examples. This is, I show you here a generalization to different initial conditions after you discover the dynamical system. What happens, as you can see, of course, you expect this to grow exponentially in time. These are two uh, good, uh, uh, so ours is, is, the, is the red line, but this this other implementation by Nat Trask and uh, others at Sandia and PNNL, they proposed something very similar, uh, but they didn't have this, this special architecture. We also have a theory that shows our, uh, that, that we can control the approximation error. And here you see two different examples. Well, the first one is uh, two gases that exchange. You, you break the barrier between them and they exchange uh, heat and volume. And then the other one here is a thermoelastic double pendulum. Uh, obviously, the errors eventually will go to order one. But uh, it's, of course, this time how much you can integrate. It's a useful time. So this is sort of the state of the art. And this extends to also um, uh, stochastic systems. So we have uh, in that paper, uh, for uh, we have a uh, stochastic system we extrapolate, um, which I think is a state of the art. Anyway, I just want to summarize and uh, talk about uh, neural operators, uh, about pins. There are all sorts of pins, different properties. Uh, Bayesian pins is one type of pins for uncertainty quantification. But as I said, we have another 11 methods for uncertainty quantification. Uh, I talk about X pins and how you solve other equations. Uh, there's a library that has been downloaded 200,000 times uh, from the GitHub. It's both in TensorFlow, DeepXD, and in PyTorch. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interest by, by industry, not I think because it's, uh, it's the greatest method ever, but I think it's very, very simple. So, so the companies are, are jumping on this and, uh, and trying to do their own thing. Now, for those of you who follow finite elements, they, you know that it took about 50 years to develop a theory, even for linear finite elements, after the original theory was, uh, or the original algorithms were proposed that they were working. Here we're trying to to have a, a smaller gap. So, um, so my group with my collaborators uh, and uh, other groups at ETH and elsewhere have actually tried to um, make some uh, rigorous proofs. In this paper, in particular, what we prove is something that we observe early on if you don't have boundary conditions for boundary value problems. Can you converge? And the answer is yes. We show here that we can converge in the L2 sense. If you have also the boundary conditions, you can converge in the H1 sense. And this is all based on, on theoretical uh, uh, arguments. In terms of uh, error estimates, you can develop both for the infinite system where you have a lot of points, residual points or collocation points, whatever people would like to call them, or the finite system, we can develop both a priori and a posteriori error estimates that show uh, convergence. The convergence rates in particular uh, could be done also for, a, for specific, um, um, mostly linear um, parabolic and elliptic uh, PDs. So this gives me the opportunity to jump to my next topic that is a functional approximation. And can I, can I ask a question before you move to the next topic? Sorry. Uh, sure. Uh, so you said that you implement the physics. Uh, do you also implement the like self similarities that come from like renormalization of of uh, variables or parameters that may have uh, units, for instance, in the pins? I haven't done it. That's an intriguing thought. Uh, um... Do you have, a, I mean, the self-similarity would, would lead to a law, right? Like a, some, some sort of a uh, algebraic law. And that, that can be incorporated. Of course, that could be incorporated as a, as a law. How to do, uh, uh, if you have other constraints, I think they can be done. Any, anything can be done if you formulate it in a way that uh, you can impose uh, soft constraints or hard constraints, actually. Uh, but that's a, that's a good, uh, explicitly, I haven't done it. I, I work with fractional PDEs that have this, uh, they, they, you know, they come from power law. A lot of them have power laws and, and, and uh, we impose them differently. But um, uh, really good question. 
um, I know exactly what you mean because I work with um, lots of experimentalists and and dynamic similarity and so on. Um, yeah, I, I, I um, if I have a better thought, I can I'll, I'll connect with you. But I, at the moment, uh, okay, I don't I don't know anybody. Uh, maybe maybe Paris or somebody else knows in the audience. Um, so uh, so I, so anyway, um, I want to talk about autonomy. For example, you're interested in autonomy. This is a real destroyer going out in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, sea state eight for those of you who sail. Sea state eight is uh, really big waves, twenty meters waves, <laughs> and um, now it takes about one week. If you are to use a CFD, it takes about one full week to do one of these simulations. Uh, this is a realistic spectrum of the sea. You dial in the spectrum and, and you get the waves and so on. You need some. But uh, so it's really impossible to use con uh, standard solver. So can you learn this motion? Can you learn the motion of the of this destroyer a priori given some excitation? So it's stochastic excitation, stochastic output. The output here I call it a function because uh, just degrees, six degrees of freedom of the motion of this. Uh, and so uh, I was wondering about that, and and of course you can go and do an LSTM right away. But I was really interested in the theory, and I found this dual theorem by Chen and Chen. Nobody ever cited this paper, uh, which was appeared at the same time as the Saipengo uh, and the Mascar and and uh, uh, paper, and Hornig papers, and so on in the early '90s. And that says basically, yes, indeed, if you have a continuous functional defined a compact set, that can be approximate arbitrarily accurately with a standard neural network. UXJ here is the input, which is a function uh, uh, sample at these M sensors, let's call them sensors. This 1D single hidden layer, it's early 90s, but that can be, of course, applied in, in the authors. Never use it in any context, but I said, okay, if we have the theorem, then we can use just off the shelf an RNN type neural network. And indeed you can, uh, train this neural network. Uh, only MIT students can do this because it takes about uh, three months to to do the to do the runs. Um, so the so this was done by Jose from MIT, uh, who is the first author of this paper. And you take the stochastic ex excitation of the of the of the ocean, Atlantic Ocean, and then you get the outputs after uh, some time offline training. Now in 0.01 seconds, sorry, in 0.01 seconds you can predict. For one excitation, different excitation, different degrees of freedom, and so on. So, so that's that. But I'm more, more broadly, I asked the question at that time, and I was teaching a class on variational calculus. Can you actually approximate uh, operators, functionals, and then operators? And uh, and uh, here I have a schematic of what I mean by operators. Could be PDEs, ODEs, Laplace transforms, uh, taking derivatives, integrals, and so on. Uh, so. Here comes DepotNet, uh, which has two parts. It has a, a part, the input, which we call branch, just like in the dendritic branches in a, in a real neuron. And importantly, and no other neural network has that, despite many claims, is that it has a trunk. And the trunk is, of course, this is axon. And that's how you connect to the output space. So this is, this is um, trunk could be the soma or it could be the axon. But this is the output space. So you have a continuous input, that's where the functions come in, and continuous output. And the two work in sync, as I will show you. Um, I was looking for a theory, and uh, and again, we have to realize what we're talking about. We're not talking about a finite dimensional space mapping to another finite dimensional space. We're talking about a banal space mapping to another banal space. So again, I found by a good uh, fortune um, that Chen and Chen have actually Produce a derived theorem. Uh, the derivation is the derivation is uh, is tedious actually. Not, since then we have uh, obtained a much uh, simpler derivation uh, by construction. But anyway, what this theorem says that if G is a nonlinear continuous operator that you want to approximate, it can be approximated with a single hidden layer, actually with two neural networks that gave us the initial. Uh, uh, idea to, uh, to, to to start with two neural networks. And one is just like before with a functional, we sample the functional here. You can see a sigma here. So you can see it's a neural network one, this one. And then there's another one that is associated with the output. And that's the, we call the trunk, just like I show you in the schematic. So, so you can think of, the, if you take a parenthesis here, 
you can think of this as a Fourier series from K1 to P of with this basis. But this basis is not Fourier. It could be Fourier. It could, we can avoid having a trunk put Fourier and we get what's called a Fourier neural network, uh, neural operator. But it's very important, in my opinion, to have the expressivity and the ability to have different adaptive bases. And these neural networks, as you know, are very good in producing bases in the first, uh, in, the, in the layer before the last one. Okay, so in summary, what we have here is, uh, we have this mathematical expression, and now we try four different implementations. This implementation here, where we take the input, at M sensors, you can have multiple branches, by the way, just like the neural network, the neural, the neurons have uh, multiple dendrites. Uh, and then and then you uh, do a projection, and then uh, you uh, also have the trunk net, and then you uh, do a reconstruction. Uh, you take the inner product and you have the output G of U, Y. Again, Y is the output, which is a continuous space, as you can see here. Now, Unfortunately, especially for operators, this doesn't work with a single neural network because of the cache of dimensionality in the input space. So we, we extended this theorem uh, to deep neural networks. So we have a proof in the paper that uh, I was in, in Nature Machine Intelligence that uh, shows that, and that's why I said this, this uh, proof is much simpler than the original one. But you can see now we replace the branch with a deep neural network and the trunk uh, similar. We have a lot of error estimates. We have done already um, uh, theoretical work on this, and then two independent groups from ETH have uh, have um, uh, obtained uh, great theoretical estimates. I'll talk about that later. So, what are we doing? We're doing the following. We're, let's say let's look, look at this uh, panel B here. We're taking an input function U, which we sample at the M sensors, and then we record the output at only a couple, of, a couple of points. In other words, if you're doing experiments or expensive uh, ab initio simulations, you only need to do two simulations to observe what is going on with this input. That's what we found empirically. Now there's theory that justifies that. In other words, I can have 100 points here to represent 100 sensors, but only two sensors of the output. After you do that 10,000 times maybe, or five 500 times, then basically if we go back to panel A, you say, Okay, for a new excitation, for inside the distribution or outside the distribution, what do you get? And the original idea was uh, to try to find this uh, integral zero to x, and x could be from zero to one, would be zero to infinity, and uh, for, for Laplace transforms, for example. And what you do here is you have, take a u of x from the hat now, which, what, what is the hat? The hat will be this input space V, which has supposed to be compact space. We ignore the compact space, so we take a GRF, Gauss random field, for certain correlation length. We take 10,000 functions, we find the integral only at one point, and then you can see here the mean square error goes down uh, to 10 to the minus five. Uh, here we compare different architectures, you can see that in the paper. I was interested in more complex operators, like the fractional operators, fractional derivatives, fractional Laplacian, in finite domains and so on. These are difficult objects to compute, so it would be nice to avoid having the cost of, of doing this. So again, just like we trained the, um, uh, before we can train with lots of functions for which we know they're fractional derivatives. This, I use the Caputo derivative. The Caputo derivative here is an operator like that. It's a singular operator at equals zero. Uh, so it works very well. One thing, the reason I'm showing this is to show the importance of the input space V. For example, I was doing Gauss random field and I would get this result. So that's for the input functions U, how, what functions you use. If you use a function, let's say the spectral approximation, you approximate your input U with, uh, with the coefficients of this, with a certain basis, either Legendre or what I have developed in some other work on poly, using polyfractonomials, you actually get a, a, an order of magnitude. If you use wavelets, I'm sure you get better results and so on. So we, uh, postulated that indeed uh, space V is very important now. Of course, we can capture that through error estimates. I'm not sure how much time I have. Uh, maybe I have time to show you this, how you can discover a uh, multi-scale operator. In other words, I want to grow bubbles. Okay, I want to grow bubbles, tiny bubbles and, and big bubbles. Some of these bubbles could be above a, a micron, can be described by the classical rayleigh plesse equation, which is this nonlinear OD, of course, we, I want, I want uh, Deponet to learn this, this um, to see if he can learn this, this uh, OD. 
Uh, so, so the problem, the setup is the following. We, we have a given a, a, an input a function, which is a function of time only. Um, we want to find the R, which is the radius of the bubble. How does it grow? Okay, so, so the input will be different uh, functions, delta P, for the pressure gradient, and then the output will be R of T for bubbles above a micron, different viscosities, different scenarios, and uh, I still use the Gauss random field. So you get these arbitrary distributions of pressure versus time. And here, here you can see the results for unseen data. Um, you can see that this is a multi-ray dynamics. And in fact, um, deponent can do pretty well uh, in predicting this for different pressure distributions. Uh, now, this is something that LSTM can do. And in fact, I show you the results here on the top. And LSTM can actually learn this multi-ray trajectory. The problem is when you only have 20 points per trajectory, LSTM can capture the low frequency, but not the high frequency. As you can see, Deponet can also do the, uh, so, so this low frequency. So we have seen that consistently in other applications that Deponet can actually replace this RNN. Um, and you have, um, you can make it as expressive as you, as you want. I will talk about that. Now, as I said, I'm interested in, in this regime from tiny bubbles here to large bubbles. So this will be the initial, the nucleation side, right? There's very, very small bubbles. And I want them to grow. Around here is the demarcation line. Here, I have to use molecular dynamics type simulations. Here, I, here uh, or you can have videos everywhere, but, but let's say I would, we don't have all this data with synthetic data. So, so how can we do a, a sort of seamless integration of, 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 of this uh, molecular and continuum regimes? So we have to demonstrate that in, we can also learn the molecular regime. Here you can see the nanobubbles. They breathe, they have stochastic fluctuations and so on. And um, so you can learn that. And then you have this huge domain with disparity in time scale. So, so it helps if you uh, know a little bit of physics. So you find this characteristic time scale that, uh, and then the domain that you do the time domain, it looks a funny domain as you can see here because, because I use this characteristic time scale. This is the size, the space domain, which is the original size of the bubble. Now I want to train to feed the neural network with DeepoNet with continuum data here, molecular data here, and let it predict in any regime. And um, yeah, you can find that also in, in a paper in Journal Fluid Mechanics um, recently. So, so even at the this is a demarcation line where both regimes are valid. Uh, it turns out we get good results. So we know how to grow bubbles now. Uh, I think I'm done. There are many, many cases that uh, people have tried. Uh, I know FDA is using DeepoNet now for this um, design a heart, a model for the heart, a computational, the first computational heart. And they're about to, to get approval. Uh, they showed me recently some of their stuff. But uh, I want to present DeepoNet not just as one neural network, but actually as a, plur a plurality of neural operators. And what do I mean by that? Uh, so, so this is the branch and you can have many different branches just like a human neuron uh, has active uh, dendrites. Uh, so take different inputs and those deep inputs could be uh, functions. It could be uh, categorical data and so on. Also, the, I told you about the trunk. The trunk itself could have any features. For example, recently we replace uh, uh, the output space, let's say Y or T with POD, uh, proper orthogonal decomposition. Uh, so we, we gave it some inductive bias and we got uh, a superior results. So, so um, operators that come along like the Fourier uh, neural operator from Caltech, and basically if you, take, if you take this basis to be trigonometric and you change this to Fourier transforms, you just have FNO. So we also have theoretical justification that FNO is just a, really a subcase, but I think any, any, any um, type of, uh, recently we use a combination of autoencoders and, um, and depot net to uh, go from a genotype to a phenotype. So, so now if you give me a phenotype, let's say biomechanics of a tissue, I can tell you from what genotype uh, will come in from mice data. Uh, so, so, some uh, departing thoughts. Um, this is from a 100 page paper of uh, Sid Misra, which is student. Um, basically, they um, confirmed that D 
Tiponet breaks the curse of dimensionality in the input space. That's very important because, of course, learning operators and the operators are parameterized. Uh, that could uh, break the bank. So, but but here it shows that actually, and we have in our original paper we show the exponential convergence of Diponet with respect to to um, to the training data. Uh, also, I told I told you about the compactness of the input space V. It turns out that uh, you can they remove that uh, compactness hypothesis on the input space uh, of the operator. Another important consideration is how do you actually sample the input space? And they found theoretically that uh, they say surprise, but the result was that a random choice of sensor points was enough to provide an almost optimal encoding error. I just remind you again that some operators that make big claims like the FNO, for example, you have to sample at a lattice. Otherwise you don't get good results for arbitrary and difficult problems. Uh, also, I talked about the continu a continuous operator. They also remove that because they can uh, work with measurable, uh, with respect to the measure that you consider a measurable space is not, uh, not with the Banach spaces that they start with. So um, this is what uh, DeepoNet, uh, uh, DeepMind wrote a, a paper, a couple of pages of paper uh, in, uh, in Nature Machine Intelligence to talk about uh, how one can use DeepoNet, especially for social dynamics. I don't know people who have done that yet, but uh, I'm sure they can be done. Um, I didn't talk about at all about the algorithmic and mathematical issues in physics informed learning. I think we have quite a bit of understanding relatively to what the field is right now. Uh, I would say certainly for the approximation error and somewhat the generalization error, a little less on the uh, optimization, a lot less maybe on optimization uh, error. I also want to advertise this uh, course that I will soon be available by NVIDIA. We're developing this deep learning for scientists and engineers. Uh, it's a mix of, uh, here I have some, the roadmap. You can see this is sort of what you would include in a standard course. I know later this week you have uh, tutorials uh, and tripods, and I know a lot of students are following. So, so this course will be free. Um, every, every one of these lectures is in independent module, it will be free from NVIDIA to download in a few months. Uh, we have quite a bit of uh, theory also, approximation theory, generalization theory. We talk about uh, uh, operate, neural operators and also we talk about uncertainty quantification. Important thing is that this is an interactive course with uh, Jupyter Notebook. So, so we have both uh, PyTorch and, 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 uh, and TensorFlow implementations for every one of the examples that we have. And, uh, uh, so so um, uh, that's coming up and I just want to thank my the sponsors, the, the Department of Energy that finally decided to pay to, uh, to sponsor us and also the um, MNURI by the Air Force that uh, uh, we started a, a, a year ago. And with that, I'll stop here. I think I'm, oh, right on time, 2.45, that's excellent. Thank you so much, George, uh, for the very inspiring talk. Uh, so we can start uh, the question. So let me begin by asking this question. So I was curious a little uh, about the part that you talked about automatically um, enforcing the hard constraints by parameterizing them in a certain way. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like, for example, how do you enforce positive semi-definiteness? Oh, no, that's, that's really, really tricky. Uh, not so easy to explain. That's why I avoid it. Uh, I will, I will um, uh, maybe I can let me see if I can share my screen again and show you that paper. The paper, uh, it's on the archive. Oh, maybe I cannot. Okay, I can go back. But the paper is on the archive. I will, I will send you, uh, if you do GFIN, I think, uh, G-F-I-N-N, you will find it on the archive. But but it is uh, it is um, uh, one of the things that we did. Is, so so you, you do have uh, four networks for the uh, entropy energy, and then this uh, the skew symmetric and the positive definite, like you said, they picked up M. Now if M can be decomposed as in terms of the gradient of E transpose times something else, which is another network times grad, gradient of E. So so we try to make that orthogonal. So that's that's uh, the architecture itself. Is such that it imposes. Same thing for the um, uh, for uh, for the L. So we have four independent neural networks, and two are just standard neural networks. 
The other ones are orthogonal modules that impose that. Uh, so you have to see a decomposition that we do in the null space and how the eigen decomposition, how, how do we actually incorporate? It's not so easy to explain because I don't have the slides here. Uh, but it, it, it is, so as I said, it, it is inspired. And then we have an approximation, universal approximation theorem to show that in this space, actually, um, uh, we have a universal approximation for that. So we have a theory that goes with that, which may, you may, may, may find interesting. Is that in the same paper that you mentioned, this universal? Yeah, yes, yeah, it's all in one paper, Jufin, and, and also it gives some review of, of the prior state of the art. Uh, this, the first paper was with soft constraints, just like Lagrangian multipliers. Um, Trask and uh, Stinis uh, um, tried to do this null uh, eigen decomposition, but they didn't quite have the theory to guide them. And then we came in and we um, did a different decomposition for the gradient of E. The gradient of E, and that that was the key to uh, to make it working um, satisfactorily. Mm -hmm. Before I ask more questions, so let me begin with the Q and A. So the first question is: Thanks for a great talk with many interesting methods and examples. Could you comment on computational time complexity in comparison to numerical solvers? Maybe some intuition on improving the computational time on larger scale systems. Um, all uh, right, so so yeah, so pins are expensive. Uh, the four for forward problems are much more expensive unless you do transfer learning and things like that. Deep nets, of course, are all very. No matter what you do, and I work with uh, some good people uh, from Johns Hopkins on a hypersonic problem recently for a DARPA project. Uh, we were solving um, tough problems a hundred thousand times faster than CFD. The reason is because we were. Um, able to learn offline and then online for deep on net, there's no training involved. So, but, but for pins, there's training inv involved when when you you trying to to predict on unseen data. So that uh, basically uh, is still very expensive. For inverse problems, I would say, for inverse problems, is pins are um, faster than most of the solvers out there, uh, depending on the problem. For forward problems. Uh, it's very slow. For example, uh, if you look at the solid mechanics problem, abacus will take uh, uh, maybe 10 minutes and uh, a pin forward problem for elasticity, hyperelasticity may take an hour and a half. So it's not competitive at all. Um, so uh, so this the idea here is not to, to replace, of course, uh, as I said, good methods um, for forward problems, but uh, for problems which are not... Um, Non, I call them non-sterilized problems or non-sterilized problems where you don't have boundary conditions, you have noisy data, uh, you don't know subgrid models, uh, closure models, and so on. I think that's where that that's sort of the niche for for pins. But deponets, as I said, deponets can be um, thought also as meta learning or as a transfer learning approach. Those are very fast. Yeah, uh, there are other people. I have seen a paper recently by. Um, uh, some researchers from Harvard that do, do one-shot uh, transfer learning with pins. Um, basically, they get the basis. It's like what we do in Vision. Uh, with pins, they can get the best basis, but for different data sets or even different equations. So the last, they, they keep only the basis from the last layer, and then they use that in one single projection for new cases. That's very, very fast, of course. So yeah, again, you amortize all the costs offline. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So we have two more questions. Uh, so uh, to approximate an operator or to approximate a functional, what if you don't have enough data in the input subspace for a large or infinite dimensional input space, observations may be quite sparse. Yeah, if you don't have enough data, that's why we say you have to have some physics. So, so in that bucket I show you, have to, you have to have some physics, some prior knowledge. Uh, we are we are advocating the use of what we have now we call functional priors use historical data your historical data can give you a meta learning environment where you can learn a lot you get the most informative prior and then you just uh, we demonstrate that even with two or three new data points actually with we solve a problem for porous medium with 100 dimensions with only 10 new measurements of conductivity and hydraulic and uh, and uh, 
and the head, dynamic head, were able to solve 100 dimensional problems. Why? Because through meta learning and, and historical data, we could improvise and have distributions, the most informative priors. Then we just, uh, the, this, the, you use the, the new data, very, very sparse data to get posteriors. So what you do that, uh, you, you get the means, but also you get the uncertainties. So this is sort of an extension. Functional priors are extensions to Bayesian. So we use uh, guns, for example, to improvise for um, uh, for obtaining the distribution. So, so for the for the person who asked the question, I would uh, search for the keyword "functional prior neural networks" and historical data. You will find it. Uh, great. So, uh, another question: Is it possible to reach the same accuracy as traditional solvers using pins for high Reynolds number compressible flows? Uh, no, it's not not even for incompressive flows at low range numbers. So, so uh, these are pretty inaccurate. Um, I, I come from the spectral community where we used to do C errors ten to the minus fourteen. Uh, you're not gonna you're not gonna see that ten to the minus five is is the ceiling now for turbulent flows. The advantage here, and we have a paper. Uh, it's called NSFNet in JCP. The last the last. Uh, Example is DNS of turbulence, incompressible turbulence. So we, we basically make the point there that, um, yes, you don't have better than 10 to the minus five accuracy with norm one, let's say, but you don't have dispersion because you never discretize. Dispersion is a big thing in turbulence, as you know. Uh, if you have dispersion, you can nicely re re laminarize the flow, although you shouldn't. So, so, so there are some issues about removing artificial dissipation, uh, but again, these errors would come from the optimization solver, right? That you can never get better than 10 to the minus five. There are attempts to uh, do what I said, use the basis from the neural network and then do these projections and you can get better accuracy. Um, some Mickey Mouse examples, uh, I have seen good results, but uh, I wouldn't do, and actually I've been doing uh, some LES with, with these methods and it takes forever to do something useful. So I wouldn't jump um, and and those, those, those people who claim to solve problem of turbulence, um, they have never published a paper in JFM. They have never published a paper in, in fluids. And they make claims that they use neural networks to solve the problem of turbulence. So I, I, I really object to that type of, of language. So, I, uh, so, I, so my answer to the, uh, to the one who asked this question is, um, no, don't use neural networks to replace DNS or LES for that matter. Not yet, anyway. Another question from Yanis Kevrakidis. Uh, when learning operators, to what extent is the resulting network an interpolation with respect to a basis that describes the training set? Yeah, that, uh, Yanis, that's a good question. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the work by, by Panos Tinis, but Panos is actually using... Um, uh, Deponet in that fashion, he uses it to obtain a basis and then he does a Galerkin projection. Uh, so, so I think it's interpolate the data that you give it. Of course, you have to give a very exhaustive set of data uh, and obtain a base, an adaptive basis. Um, and that's all I can tell you. I think it will depend very much on, on your input space V, how you define that. If you if you have multi scale, for example, if you do if you pull functions from a GRF only at one at one um, correlation length, you're not gonna do. You know you're gonna you're not gonna produce a multi scale um, basis. But if you if you if you, you if you define your space V as a union of different Gauss random fields at different correlation lengths, and I've seen that, you can actually get a pretty good basis that can capture lots of multi scale features. And, and, and in in bands, so that's my answer to Yanis. Thank you. Uh, one another question, if you have enough time. Uh, thanks uh, for the very nice talk. Would it be possible to have access to the sl oh, uh, uh, slides? Um, and then also, could you please share the reference to the uh, UQ paper? Yes. Um, it's not on the archive yet. We have submitted, but we have a difficulty <laughs> submitting it to the archive because, because it's a very big file. So uh, um, uh, it's, 
I, I don't have the reference yet. It's as, as I said, it's not uh, open yet. So we uh, stay tuned. In in the next two or three days, it will be available in the archive. We're we're working on the on the bugs of. Um, uh, and there will be also a manual that that will follow up with. Um, uh, so all the techniques that Rose was talking about, they're covered here, but there's also some other, like uh, functional priors, for example, polynomial chaos, um, uh, learning in model space. Um, uh, lots of, with, with this, um, uh, lots of different techniques for, uh, for functions, for uh, PDEs, and also for neural operators. So it's UQ, it's very holistic, actually. And also, as I said, the total uncertainty. I don't have the reference, I'm sorry. I have just one quick question. Uh, uh, how how do you go about learning chaotic dynamical systems um, oh. using pins? Oh, uh, using pins? Uh, what do you mean it, learning dynamical systems using pins? I mean, in general. So, um, I mean, my, my my background is not in this area. So I'm asking, like, given a... Uh, uh, a chaotic dynamical system, which is very sensitive to initial conditions, how can we hope to basically train a neural network can, that can generalize? Well, pins use the equations. So if you use the equations and you do the right thing, then, then you should be able to do what the, the solvers, the other solvers do, but not, not um, but, but you're right, because of the uncertainty with the optimization, uh, you don't have the, um, uh, the accuracy that you need. If you are, if you're actually discovering, trying to discover a dynamical system from data and then you extrapolate, that's not necessarily pins. Um, this is just under, you know, there are other methods like neural ODE and the method I, I show you, the, G, the generic formulation that uh, induces that and, and so on. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, no matter what you, pin or, pins or, or X pins or, 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 or G fins, it's the same problem. It's not gonna, <laughs> that's not going to go away. So the question is how long can you actually sustain the valid time? And, yeah. uh, but of course, with data and correct, correcting the trajectories, right? If you, if you think ab about that, having some observers, some sensors and so on, correcting the trajectories, that's very, that can be very easily incorporated into pins. So you don't need any special data simulation scheme to do that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, and I, in the context of what uh, Orr was saying, that you need 10% 10, 10 um, observers to get the chaotic trajectory, that's kind of depends on the problem, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I guess uh, there are no uh, questions from the audience. Any questions from the panelists? Um, all right. Uh, thank you so much, George, uh, for your excellent presentation. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, attending the workshop. So this concludes uh, our second day. And uh, we are looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow, at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you so much. Thanks, man.